Ephesians 6.10. I'll give you that. You can look for that. We have religious freedom in this country. You have freedom to believe, freedom not to believe. You have the freedom to be a Christian. You can be a Muslim. You can be anything you want to be. You, begin any, you can be any kind of stripe of Christian that you want to be. Some of them are Christian and some ain't. <laughs> they call themselves Christian. But you can, you can be a Pentecostal. You can be a Baptist. You can be a Lutheran. You can be a Methodist. You can be anything you want to be. You can be Christian science. You, they're just Jehovah Witness. There's freedom of religion here. There's no country like this in the whole world. Just look at the French. Well, you don't know about the French. Bishop Sherman was going over there evangelizing, can't go anymore, shut them down. Well, this country we fought many great wars and many things have happened and we've just ended a conflict uh, to, to ensure our freedom, amen? And bring freedom to other people in this world, whether they want it, sometimes I wonder whether they want it or not, amen? <laughs> but I'm going to talk about a different kind of war. A war that's been going on for a long time. An award that has also enabled us to stand behind this pulpit this morning and preach the truth. And that is a war for Jesus. A war that the church has been in since the day of its establishment. A war, and there have been great warriors in this church. But first off, I'm going to tell you what we're fighting against. We don't fight against governments. Although governments are the enemy's instrument. We don't fight against organizations, although organizations can be the instrument of the enemy. We don't fight against anything that's fleshly. At the first sand war, General Schwarzkopf knew who he was going against, and he took that thing quickly. At this war, they knew the enemy, amen? They knew what they were going against, and they went right for him, and they just took him, amen? But the church is a disorganized, disjointed mess. And a good part of the church is in a war, and they don't even know who the enemy is. The Baptists fight with the Pentecost, and the Pentecosts fight with the Lutherans, and the, and, and the you know, and the charismatics fight with the Pentecostals. There ain't enough difference. You can even know which one is which. Amen? Well, what are they fighting? Well, my Bible tells me this. We're going to look at Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. We fight against the wiles of the devil. And the devil is one organized devil. He, well, i got to read a couple more verses to get there. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers and rules of darkness of this age, against spirits of hosts of wickedness, wickedness in heavenly places. The devil's got all his guys and his demons and his fallen angels and the spirits of the giants and all the stuff that he has to work against us. He's got it all organized in ranks. How many remember about talking about you were in the military? Well, in your military, there was order, amen? I mean... If you didn't stay in order, you peeled potatoes, and then it could get worse than that. Well, that's the way the devil's got his group organized. They're, they're extremely organized. you got to understand that the devil is not omnipotent. That means he's not all-powerful. Neither is he omnipresent. That doesn't mean he, that means he's not everywhere all the time. That's the advantage we got on being God's side. He's everywhere all the time, and he endues us with his Holy Spirit. And without the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we couldn't fight this war because physically we are just disorganized. Right? I mean, the devil uses the church as much as he uses anything else. So we fight not against flesh and blood, but principalities and power, spiritual dark forces of the enemy that come against us and work in various ways to tear us down so that we may not have the victory. But over... How God has set it up. He has set up an organization. Here we're right back to it again. That how it's supposed to be. He set for the church apostles, prophets, 
teachers, pastors, and evangelists to perfect the saints, to get organized, amen, to fight the bottle. And I, I'm going to tell you, this is going to be sort of a historical lesson for y'all. I'm going to tell you about some of what we might call John's, God's generals, or they, you might call them apostles, sent forth ones. But I'm going to tell you about some of the people that have put us in the position we are that we still have the faith of Jesus Christ, that we still have the Word of God such as it is correct, that we're still able to walk in faith in God because this thing has not been destroyed. It took a lot of sacrifice, like it took a lot of sacrifice, and a lot of people died so that this country might be what it is, there have been a lot of people died for Jesus Christ so that we might have what we have. We have the 12 apostles or more. There's 35 apostles. Don't get rattled at this now. In the New Testament, there's 35 apostles listed. We got the 12, and then we got what we call the sub-apostles or the the ones that came after, the next generation. We got Barnabas and so forth and so forth and so forth. Almost every one of these apostles died a martyr's death for the faith. Paul was crucified upside down in Rome. Peter was beheaded in Rome. Stephen was stoned. Was what? Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded. I got him backwards. Paul was beheaded in Rome. Both of them in Rome. Thomas was burned to death in the Far East. Did you know that? Thomas was burned to death in the Far East. Guinea, Timothy had his skin pulled off a strip at a time. Skinned alive. Now, the Apostle John... Was, didn't have a martyr's death, but they tried to boil him in oil, but he wouldn't cook. They put him in. So they put him on the Isle of Patmos and say, this guy just won't burn. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> God's powerful, amen? So, and, and all the rest of the apostles, if you study it, all the, all the apostles of the first century, about all 35 of them, just about every one of them, died a martyr's death for the faith in Jesus Christ. Because somebody was trying to stop it. Who's trying to stop it? Was it the Pharisees or the Roman government? It's the devil that was working in them. He's trying to stop. He says, this thing is about to take over. i got to stop these generals. i got to stop these people. Because if this thing gets loose, in the lifetime of these 35 original apostles, the gospel was spread around the entire known world. In 40 years. 40 years, the entire known world, all the way to China, was established. There was churches established all around that world because people were willing to die for the faith. And they said, oh boy, now they want us to be martyrs. You may end up being martyrs standing for the faith because we don't know what's coming next. Amen? Polycarp. This is a history lesson this morning. Warriors for God. Polycarp. Greatest story of martyrdom of all time was Polycarp. He was an apostle of John's. He was a student of the apostle John. Lived just one generation after John. They took him into the Roman arena. And they tried to feed him to the lions. They wouldn't eat him. He was already full. Lions wouldn't eat him. So they sent the gladiators after him. Didn't seem to be able to touch him. Isn't that something? He was 87 years old. They finally tied him to a stake and burned him. He wouldn't burn. His body just stood there full and he just... The whole time that the flames around him, and then suddenly he turned to a pile of ashes and a dove flew out. Died for the faith. 
My, my, my. So th these are the kind of people that are behind this movement of God that is going to be in this end days that are going to bring. So we've got to be this kind of people. We've got to be this kind of apostolic people like the apostles that we will hang on to the faith of God no matter what persecutes us. Where do you see the church prospering? And not in the United States of America. We're a soft bunch of sorry citizens of the kingdom of God. Around the world, in China, where the church is being persecuted, the church has grown to let one-third of the Chinese people are now born-again Christians. Did you know it's going that fast? In the last 10 years, it's just been phenomenal. The more persecution, the greater growth of the church. You can, you can study that through all history. The least persecution, the church gets soft. Can we take the fire? Amen. Huss. So we, then we go through a thousand years of, of the church degenerating until the point that it even looked like the church. And that there's sometimes there's some generals, but I'm just kind of taking a leap of a thousand years here from Polycarp to Huss. Huss said that Jesus Christ sits bodily at the right hand of the Father, and they burn him at the stake. They burn him at the stake. Because they said he was a heretic. The foundation of the faith. And the Bible says it six times that Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. Hallelujah. He sits at the right hand of the Father bodily. This stand of Huss spurred the beginning of what we call the Reformation. This spurred Luther. To understand that you're saved by faith, not by works. And he made a stand for the Christian faith. And he brought out the truth of the gospel. And he also, Luther came to realization that the Bible needed to be in the hands of the people. Up to this time, the church who burnt us had said, people don't, they can't understand that. So you can't have that. So people didn't have Bibles. You just had to take what the priest said. That was it. What the preacher said, you just had to take what for truth. And not only the high, most of them didn't get their hands on one either. Luther finally got his hands on one. And he said, the just shall live by faith. Got it out of Romans. All of a sudden, his entire thought changed. His mind had a transformation in it. Suddenly, he became a man of God, and he tacked the thing on the wall, and he says, this is how things ought to change, and they threw him out, and they wanted to burn him. But he got himself a little army because some, the general of, or the, the, the Germany was duchies, they called them then, little separate states. He was in a very strong state, and the head of that state got converted. And so Luther had an army. Otherwise, they would have burned him. He was protected. But he suffered much persecution. He translated the Bible into German, which was the first time that a Bible was made into a language of the common people. They might be able to grab one and read it. A general of the faith. One who, without the efforts of Huss, Without the efforts of Luther and them believing it, we wouldn't be able to continue in the process. And I've been preaching this for a while. We're still in the Reformation. God wants his church reformed and to be perfect without spot and without wrinkle. Amen? And we're still in it. It ain't over yet. The church is being transformed day by day. He's bringing fresh revelation and knowledge into the church. He's bringing people, ripping them out of their mess and bring him further further forward amen that 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 we might be what he wants us to be amen i mean it just keeps going after luther brought salvation by faith john wesley the movement with john wesley brought holiness back into the church wesley preached holiness and perfection and that you should live a life that is above sin that you don't just have to live in a bucket of it, that you can get out of it. Sometimes there were 
And I'm going to say, in every one of these movements, there were some excesses and different things were done wrong. But you've got to understand, every man that's called by God is still a man, and the enemy still tries to get him. Amen? The first great awakening that came was through Knox at the Welch community. If I got this straight, I hope I can remember all this, because I don't write it all down. I just remember it. If it's wrong, it ain't that wrong. To where... Holiness and power transform people's lives instantaneously. That at the first great awakening, if it hadn't been for the first great awakening with John Knox, and I think I got, I'll get this straight here, with John Knox, and then following him, Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts is the Welch Revival. Knox first, then Roberts. And the Cane Ridge meeting in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, these three movements that took place in just a short period of about 30 years, we would not have the Church of Jesus Christ in existence today. Because the entire church was starting to, embar to embrace a doctrine of universal salvation. You know what that means? Everybody's saved. You're all going to get there one way or another. Now, now, what in the world is a use for a preacher if everybody's going to go to heaven sooner or later one way or the I'd be out of a job. <laughs> you know, what in the world was a use for a preacher if universal salvation were true? It was going through the church like crazy. It's making its ugly head. It's sticking itself up now. There's a couple universalists preaching... In our, in more than a couple, there's 10, 15 universalists preaching in our Iowa City area right now. Some of them put it on the sign and some of them don't. Out of that came what's called the Universalist Unitarian Church. They believe both thieves went to heaven. This was sweeping through the church. You will find out that in the 1800s, the remnants that did not come into the Great Awakening, into the Cane Ridge meeting, into the Welch meeting later on, that did not come into this movement, that these other offshoots, Christian scientists, um, Jehovah Witness, Worldwide Church of God, which I was part of at one time, all believe in universal salvation. They don't tell you up front. Later on, you got to study in deeper. And later on, everybody gets a second chance. Why preach? Huh? But God moved sovereignly through these men who stood up for the truth in opposition from all those around him. And, all, and, and these great moves happened. The first great awakening, the second great awakening, the Welch revival with Edwin Roberts, where... God really began with Evan Roberts and the Welch Revival, the beginning of what we call the Pentecostal movement or the full gospel movement or the restoration of spiritual gifts operating in the church. It really began there. We always say all oh, us old Pentecostals from this country say, oh, the Azusa Street meeting. The Welch Revival came first. In 1895, the Welch Revival struck. I got to say, well, you say you're talking about all men. I'm going to give you women a break here. There was two little old women. You don't, you don't think you can do something for God, women? We're going to get to later on when things freed up, they let women get behind the pulpit like they should. And we'll talk about some more women before we finish up here. But at the Welch Revival, there was two little old ladies. One blind, one deaf. The one did the hearing for the other one, and the other one did the seeing from the other one. That's how they got along. Prayed for years. And the Lord told them that Evan Roberts was going to come preach a revival in their church. And they were down to about eight people in that church. Nobody come to that church. And the town was just full of sin. It was full of taverns and brothels. These two women prayed for ten years. For revival to come to their town. Ten years. And then the Lord told them that Evan Roberts was coming. 
So they made up posters, and they put them all over town. They got some young people to go help them, and they put them up all over town that Evan Roberts was coming, and they invited Evan Roberts, and he sent back a letter that says, I ain't coming. There's a big convention. I'm going to go to one here, there, there. There's a big convention I'm going to, and it's a big convention of the, it actually was a congregational church. Evan Roberts was sitting on the front row at the convention, prepared to be the next speaker up. Probably on had a nice new coat and tie on like I got. Looked real pretty. And the Lord spoke to him and he says, you get up and get out of there and you go preach that revival. When he got to the church, he was five minutes late and it was clear full. He preached that night. He had a little trouble with the pastor. The pastor said, you can just preach one night. Well, the people came the next night, and they just kept coming. It went on for several years. People got saved like crazy. The gifts of the Spirit started to operate in the church once again. In other words, people were starting to speak in tongues, lay hands on the sick, all this stuff that hadn't happened in the church in years. The brothels all closed because the prostitutes all got saved. And the men got saved, and there wasn't no business. And the whiskey joints all closed up. Everybody quit drinking. And the thing spread, and out of that, preachers came to New York. And a great revival struck in New York. And then they went to, they went to uh, uh, California, where some little old ladies been sitting praying. And the Azusa Street revival broke out. People came from all around the world. The Azusa Street Revival with the, with the man, who, which the power started with a man named Parham at Parham School. They sought to see what the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. One little woman started speaking in tongues, spoke in legible Chinese for four days, couldn't speak in anything else. The Azusa Street Revival broke out. Later, after a one-eyed black man by the name of Simpson, went to Parham School, but prejudice was so strong, strong, my brothers, that he had to sit on the porch and go to Bible school through the screen door because they wouldn't let him sit inside. <laughs> That's the truth. They wouldn't let him sit inside with the other folk. He went and established the Azusa Street Mission. People of every race, color, and creed came from around the world in the greatest movement in Christianity, which at this point in time right now, this movement, over one-third of the Christians upon earth are full gospel people. A movement that started 100 years ago now didn't exist 100 years ago because he was a man of God, and he was touched by God so strongly that no matter what, the prejudice of the people that were running the Bible school wouldn't let him in the door. He was willing to submit himself to God and sit on a chair in the porch and go to school through the screen door. And people were touched by every, every denomination, every Christian, everything. Out of this sprung all the great full gospel denominations and movements there are to this day, the Church of God in Christ, the Assembly of God, the Church of God, you name it, all the, everything, the Four Square Church, all those movements came out of Azusa Street. Great warriors of God came out of there. Amy Simpson McPherson, who was the founder of the Four Square denomination, preached healing. Then the great, after the this gift of the Spirit started to operate. Then the great healing movement started with McPherson and then later on with Oral Roberts and, and uh, all these different preachers. I'm, names won't come to me fast enough. T.L. Osborne and, and so forth till this very day that the healing movement came into the church and all of a sudden we started to realize there was more to it than just coming to church on a Sunday morning. The power of God started to move forth until we are at this end times where the church is starting to be reestablished the way it should be with all five-fold gifts of the Spirit, all, the gift, all nine gifts of the Spirit, and the five-fold ministry of apostles, prophets, teachers, and evangelists, pastors, are once again being established in the church. There were hundreds and thousands of little 
churches with little pastors and little preachers that brought forth the message that stood for Christ under any kind of opposition that came. Amen? That we might have the truth of God at this very day. We've been in a war. We're still in a battle. The victory is ours because Jesus already did it, but we still have to fight the fight. Apostle Crawford gave out a little flyer. Stating the difference in between a pastor and an apostle. It says that a pastor looks at a church as a family and a flock. And I do that to a certain extent. An apostle looks at you as an army. You all know that I look at you as an army. So, we're in a war. He's looking for soldiers. Someone that will say, okay, God, I'll do what you ask. I was talking about the situation this morning in the class, and I said, you know, the first thing you got to do is get right with God. Just give up. Give up. Just give up. What are you going to give up? I don't know what you're going to give up. You're going to give yourself up. You just say, I surrender. That's how it was with me. I'd studied the Bible. I'd known so much. And I, could, I could make preachers crazy because I knew the Bible so well. And I didn't know Jesus. Well, maybe I did know him. I knew him, but I didn't want to do what he wanted me to do. I wanted to do what John Hahn wanted to do. I knew what he wanted me to do. I knew what the call was. I knew what I was supposed to do. I didn't want to do it. One day I just said, I give up. I surrender. The old hymn, I surrender all. My God did my life change. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of souls come to Christ under our ministry. May not look like it here this morning, but David knows this is true. They've come, they've gone. We preached around the world. I preached around the whole country and in Mexico. Seen people come to Christ. That's what he wants out of you. You don't know. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher. But you do have to reach out, be a reacher. Hey, that's good. You don't have to be a preacher, but you need to be a reacher. Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 319-828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204, Oxford, Iowa, 52322 or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org. This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa.